Hello, welcome to Chapter 8, Foreign Direct Investments. Um, in this chapter, we'll talk about um, investing in foreign countries. Okay, let's get started. So what is foreign direct investment? And this is pretty much what it sounds like. It's when a company invests directly into a market or a foreign country, either expanding or developing um, retail or storage loca locations outside of their home country. And foreign direct investment is one way to become a multinational enterprise. And you can do what's called a greenfield investment, which is the establishment of a wholly owned new operation in a foreign country, or make an acquisition or a merger with an existing company to get access to the foreign market. And we saw uh, in one of the earlier chapters, we talked about Walmart and how Walmart purchased a uh, supermarket chain in Germany to get started in Germany. Uh, a venture, a foreign direct investment la later failed, but <clears throat> that's usually the quickest way to get a foothold into a foreign market is to establish uh, a merger acquisition with another company that's already in that market. Okay, so there are two ways to look at FDI. The amount of FDI undertaken over a given time period, we have the outflows of foreign direct investment out of the country and the inflows into the country. So the United States has a large amount of money that is directed into um, foreign businesses every year, but we also have a huge amount of money that's invested in our domestic business from foreign sources. <clears throat> so let's, let's talk about some trends in FDI. The past 35 years have been um, a huge increase in the flow of FDI in the world economy. The average yearly outflow of FDI increased from $25 billion in 1975 to $1.5 trillion today. And the FDI outflows did contract around... 1.1 trillion during the Great Recession, but that's to, to be expected as companies pulled back in response to the recession. Um, as markets have become freer, FDI has grown uh, alongside with a free trade. Um, and it is, you know, despite the general decline in trade barriers over the past 30 years, firms still, still feel uh, fear protectionist pressure. So executives see foreign direct investment as a way to circumvent trade barriers <clears throat> to establish or increase uh, FDI has been <clears throat> driven by political and economic changes um, that have been occurring in many of the world's developing nation, uh, nations. The general shift towards domestic political institutions and free market economies that we discussed um, in earlier chapters has encouraged more FDI. So, you know, if you're, if you're, you know, for example, a lot of foreign automakers um, are, see a lot of laws and a lot of potential for tariffs and quotas on in, imports of uh, foreign vehicles into the United States and the requirements of a certain percentage of the car being um, domestic has encouraged many of these um, auto manufacturers to develop production plants inside the United States. Also, very, very, uh, many, a lot of American companies developed uh, subsidiaries in the Eurozone, so they had access to the Eurozone without uh, many of these trade restrictions as well. In fact, Ireland was a favorite destination in many countries to set up shop in Ireland and uh, take advantage of a business-friendly country and get direct access to the Eurozone without having to worry about all the tariffs uh, that will be inflicted upon your um, tariffs and trade, uh, administrative paperwork and all that sort of things if you're trying to um, export from the United States directly into the Eurozone. So this way you can establish a, a, a subsidiary in, say, Ireland, and then you have access to ship to any of the Eurozone countries. And of course, with globalization, you know, uh, companies um, 
want to have a presence all around the world. And, you know, with the pressure of stock markets for companies having to increase sales and increase the profits, they need to expand globally to maintain that momentum moving forward. Here are some trends and you can see the overall trend is increasing except in times of recession in the early 2000s and the mid 2000s. Um, uh, in the past, most of foreign direct investment was targeted at in between developing nations, um, specifically the United States and European Union. But more recently, the whole world has been able to share in the foreign direct investment as much of the foreign direct investment has been shifted towards the development world. And we can see a lot of developing countries benefiting from this foreign direct investment, specifically China, as other companies rush in to get involved in growth markets of, say, China, India, Latin America, Brazil, things of that nature. Um, okay. Since World War II, the U.S. has been the largest source of foreign direct investments uh, in total, and that makes sense since it's, the world's, it's been the world's largest economy for 40 years or so. But other countries that have a high amount of investment in, in foreign direct investment to other countries, of course, are certain European countries like, you know, you have England, France, Germany, Japan being the big four. And recently, Chinese companies have emerged as a major foreign investor as Chinese companies have been making a lot of money over the past 20 years, have been uh, turning it around and using foreign direct investments. One specific area would be commodities, and they've invested heavily in countries like Brazil, uh, Venezuela, and uh, Australia. And here is just the levels of foreign direct investments. You can see by far, the United States is the biggest still. Okay, so let's talk about forms of um, foreign direct investment. Um, now, the uh, foreign direct investment um, can take a few different forms. Like I was saying before, there's the greenfield investment, where you build a new facility or, or an acquisition of a, of a merger with an existing local firm. Uh, the UN estimates that somewhere between 40 to 80 percent of all foreign direct Investment inflows were this type of form of merger acquisition. Um, and acquisitions accounted for about 78% of all foreign direct investment. And the reason is because once you make an acquisition, everything's already set up for you. The employees, the facilities, the stores, the paperwork, the government ties. It's just a much easier thing to do rather than starting from scratch in a foreign country where you're not familiar with the tastes, the culture, the bureaucracy. So that's why those acquisitions are so popular. Um, you know, however, foreign direct, uh, foreign direct investment flows into developing nations differ from those of developed nations. In the case of developing nations, um, about two-thirds um, come from cross-border mergers and acquisitions. A lower percentage of mergers and acquisitions, acquisitions may simply reflect the fact that there are fewer target companies to acquire in developing countries. This makes sense. So there may not be uh, a, a local company that, you know, a supermarket chain that you could buy out. So you have to go in there and create it from scratch. So, um, I mean, firms do prefer to acquire existing assets rather than undertake uh, greenfield investment. However, it's sometimes you have no choice. Uh, the uh, acquisitions are quicker to execute. Uh, however, you know, sometimes if there's no market there, you're really the first mover. You may have to build up your own uh, distribution and, and uh, retail locations and manufacturing plants yourself. Okay. Let's talk about some theories. Limitations to exporting. Um, if your expo exporting strategy has its advantages and disadvantages. Um, so really, you might ask, why does a firm go to the trouble of establishing operations abroad through foreign direct investment when two alternatives, uh, exporting and licensing, are available for them to use uh, for getting their products uh, into foreign markets? Well, I mean, exporting, of course, involves producing goods at home and shipping them 
to a receiving company for sale and licensing be granting a foreign entity the license or the right to to produce and sell a firm's uh, products uh, in return for royalty for every unit sold. Um, now this is a good a good question of why not just do that licensing or exporting, and given that the cursory examination of the topic suggests that foreign direct investment may be both expensive and risky compared to uh, exporting and licensing. However, um, foreign direct investment can be more profitable and could be um, longer term add much more wealth to the company. I mean it's riskier sure but if you have a good product and you have a good market research and you see the country is ready for it um, it's better to do the foreign direct investment. Some companies may start with exporting first see how the product takes and if the exporting goes well then they could make a further on investment in the far in foreign directly investing in the country to set up their own shop and, and subsidiary in that country so it's sort of a um, a process some com some companies may just go right and do the foreign direct investment right away and some may actually test the waters with a licensing or exporting agreement first And of course, you may do if there's strict trade, like we learned in last chap the last chapter. If there's strict trade threats or barriers or quotas or tariffs or administrative problems, um, or or direct uh, domestic um, components percentages required, it may be easier to have a foreign presence rather than export. And that's probably I think the biggest reason. Let's look at some of the. Um, the limitations of uh, licensing, you know. Um, so, licensing uh, may result in a firm giving away valuable technology and know-how to a potential foreign competitor. So, if you license, um, if Tesla wants to license its a know-how and ability to make electric cars in China or in, say, India. They run the risk of these companies learning how to learning all the the, the detailed, and sophisticated technology and assembly know-how, and going into competition directly against Tesla at some point in the future. You know, for example, in the 1960s, RCA licensed its leading-edge color television technology to a number of Japanese companies, including um, uh, Sony. Uh, and at the time, RCA saw licensing as a way to earn good return from its technology know-how in the Japanese market without the costs and risks of foreign direct investment. However, the companies that they licensed this technology to quickly assimilated RCA's technology and learned how to enter the U.S. market and compete directly against RCA with their own television sets. As a result, RCA is now a minor player in its own home market, and the Japanese firms own a much bigger share of um, the television markets. Um, you know, second problem with licensing is it does not give a firm uh, the tight control over manufacturing, marketing, quality, and strategy in the foreign country that may require uh, to maximize those profits. So you lose some control when you license your product. Um, so with licensing, control of manufacturing and marketing and strategy are granted to the licensee in return for royalty fee. So for every unit they sell, they pay you back a royalty. However, for both strategic and operational region, reasons, a firm may want to retain control over these functions. And the rationale for wanting control is that your strategy that you want to deploy, you think will be uh, more successful. Uh, and it would be a way of more aggressively keeping the foreign competitors in check. Um, so having licensing, you lose a certain amount of control. So that's a big negative for it. A third problem with licensing arises when a firm's competitive advantage is not based much on its products as the management, marketing, and marketing capacities um, or capabilities that uh, produce the products. And the problem here is that such capacities are often not amenable through licensing. So if your strength is really through your marketing and your advertising uh, to sell your product, and your product might be more of a commodity where it's very similar, maybe it's sugar, you know, um, then um, it's not going to be as beneficial to license. Um, all right. So 
to licensing, you could lose uh, some competitive advantage by not having total control over it. Okay, so advantages far advantages of foreign direct investment. Um, it follows that a firm will favor foreign direct investment over exporting as an, as an entry strategy when transportation costs or trade barriers make exporting unattractive. Sort of like, you know, Coca-Cola. You wouldn't export full bottles of soda uh, because of the uh, cost of exporting that weight. It'd be much easier to make a foreign direct investment in the bottling plant in a foreign country and bottle the soda directly in a foreign country, saving huge amounts of money in the transport. Um, so firms will favor foreign direct investment over licensing or franchising when it wishes to maintain control over its technology, know-how, its operation, or its business strategy, uh, or when the firm's capabilities are simply not amenable to licensing and just you not be able to handle it. In the case of Coca-Cola, they may want to also maintain the uniqueness and the secret formula of their soda and not license it to somebody else that could turn around and start producing their own competitive brand that they would have to compete with. Okay, um, let's look at the uh, patterns of foreign direct investment. That for, um, so, okay, um, so let's look at strategic behavior. Um, Nickerbocker explored the relationship between FDI and um, competition in olig an oligopolic, oligopoly type of environment where industries, a limited number of industries compete. Um, now, an oligop oligopoly, we all know the game monopoly, where there's one company that dominates everything. An oligopoly is a few companies um, running two or three companies controlling everything. So an industry composed of limited number of firms um, is going to be sort of uh, a unique strategic behavior. Uh, critical critical comp competitive. I can't talk today. Uh, competition um, when you only have a couple major players. Maybe we're talking Coke and Pepsi. Uh, when one firm uh, does have an immediate impact on a major competitor forcing a response in kind. So if Coke moves into, say, um, I, uh, Iraq, Pepsi has to also be there because they don't want the other company to get a, fo a strong foothold before the other company can get there and start competing. So by cutting prices, one firm, uh, one of the two or three oligopolies uh, can take market share away from competitors, forcing them to respond with a similar price cuts to retain market share. Thus, the interdependence between firms in, in, a, in a oligopoly leads to uh, imitate behavior. Uh, rivals often quickly imitate uh, what a firm does, you know, what their direct competition is doing. So if you have, a, say, like a soda industry, Coke or Pepsi will quickly follow each other in their foreign direct investments to maintain a global competitive edge. So it's sort of a multi-point competition. Um, when there, um, when two or more enterprises encounter each other in different regions or markets, national or industries, uh, an economic theory suggests that different regional markets, now, um, you know, are going to be a big competitive area, uh, and that that rather sort of like a game of chess, they're going to, you know, one move uh, by one company indicates the next move by the next company trying to outdo uh, and match each other's strategy to hold each other in check so no one can get too far ahead of the other one. Um, so Knickerbocker's theory helps to explain the extension of why uh, imitative foreign direct investment behavior among an industry with only a few large firms in it is pretty commonplace. Okay, If we look at the product life cycle here, um, this is going to be, um, the product life cycle has a lot to do with when a particular foreign direct investment will occur. So firms have, you know, when they develop products, it can, it can be, 
you know, sort of in the beginning, they're not going to, how can I say, if a, if a product is in the beginning of its product life cycle, it's not going to be immediately a candidate for foreign direct investment. Um, but when the product life cycle gets to a, a rapidly expanding phase, sort of like Netflix a few years ago, they're going to look, they started originally in the United States. It grows to a significant business in the United States. And when the momentum is growing and it's, it's a fast growing um, product, before it gets to a maturing stage, they're going to want to expand overseas before an overseas competitor fills the void. So lots of times when a domestic product or service becomes from a, a, the first cycle of its product life cycle in a slow growth originating, uh, not a slow growth, but a um, startup, and it goes into the second phase where it's ex uh, expanding quickly, they're going to want to make the foreign direct investments to leverage this uh, idea worldwide before a competitor fills that void. Um, and as the firm's awareness grows bigger and they can move into countries, the local demand will be significant, then they're going to start also shifting production out of the more expensive uh, country like the United States into lower um, cost developing countries as the need for their products in those regions of the world increase. Uh, and they're trying to maintain, hopefully they can maintain a product standardization um, and create uh, a price competition and, and reduce their cost pressures by these foreign direct investments. So the product life cycle does have a lot to do with um, how with how um, a product how how and when a company will would start directing in foreign markets based on the um, position that the company is in its product life cycle. Um, so ideology towards investment has a range from a radical stance to a hostile to all foreign direct investments in, in certain free market economies. So for example, um, you know, if you look at certain countries, there, there could be reasons why they want to keep out some foreign direct investment. Uh, for example, if they fear that their domestic culture will be overtaken by American movies, such as you know countries like France and China. They may want to actually limit the amount of um, exposure by limiting the amount of investment that companies can make in movie theaters or production or, or um, directly uh, investing in advertising their movies abroad. Um, if you know if the if a country is trying to protect protect its domestic auto business, it may not may reject um, foreign uh, investors coming in to set up their foreign companies inside of their country to protect their you know national corporation. So there could be some resistance to foreign direct investment. And if in the United States, we had a few a few specific instances where there was some. Um, maybe with Saudi Arabia, I'm not sure. Some country in the Middle East wanted to invest in and buy uh, shipping ports in the United States, and that was uh, fought against uh, and uh, against them doing that because of fears arising from 9/11. Uh, also, uh, many times Chinese companies want to buy energy reserves or energy companies or certain key companies that uh, are tied to the defense of the United States. Um, companies that have access to data banks or um, storage facility or farms or sensitive technologies and they may step in and prevent the foreign direct investment because of national security concerns or di different things of you know of that matter okay so if we look at the radical view um, from you know Let's think about this for a second. Okay, um, there are always radical views in any any area of government or investment or um, when we're taking actions between countries. And they argue that multinationals extract profits from a host company and take them home to their to their country, giving nothing of value to the host country in exchange. Well, I guess that can be true, but a lot of times the United States. Um, 
companies that invest overseas like to keep the money overseas because if they bring it home, they have to pay tax on it. I think um, Apple has like $500 billion of profits overseas that were, they're reluctant to bring home because they're going to have to pay U.S. tax once they bring that money home. So they keep that money overseas and keep investing in overseas operations. So I don't think that's um, a fear that, that a lot of companies should have based on your United States foreign direct investment. Although, you know, for example, that key technology is tightly controlled by multinationals and that, is, that important jobs in foreign subsidiaries um, go to um, home country nationals rather than citizens of the host country. So if they set up shop in a foreign country, they want to bring over their own employees to help safeguard their company secrets and, and production um, techniques or technology or certain innovations they have, they don't want to fall in the hands of competitors. Because of this, according to the radical view, foreign direct investment by multinational enterprises of advanced capitalist country um, keep the less developed countries of the world relatively backwards and dependent on the advanced capitalistic nations for investments, jobs, and technology since they are so protective of this information. Um, according to the extreme version of this view, no country should ever permit foreign companies corporations to undertake a foreign addressing direct investment because they can never be instrumental um, to the economic development only the economic domination of that foreign country um, so if there is a multinational and under the radical view in your country you should nationalize it and this happened um, and a lot of American uh, corporations, especially or oil corporations in the Middle East and in Mexico, and the the um, companies were nationalized and, and the property was stolen from the multinational companies. Uh, I think this also happened in Venezuela and it made part of the state facility. So from 1945 to 1980, the radical view was very influential in the world economy. Until the cl collapse of communism, uh, countries of Eastern Europe opposed any foreign direct investment. So uh, communist countries elsewhere, China, Cambodia, Cuba, were also opposed to the principle of foreign direct investment, fearing um, increasing presence of uh, corporations would increase influence of foreign hostile governments. So China, China eventually started to allow foreign direct investment in the 70s and accelerated it well into today. Um, so then with the collapse of communism, of course, a lot of foreign direct investment, mostly from Europe, flew into the former communist states. Uh, and this has helped accelerate the world trade pretty quickly as these economies, uh, these developing countries started to perform better when they embraced capitalism and allowed in more foreign direct uh, investment into the country. Okay, so let's talk about the free market view. Um, the free market view traces its roots to classic economies and the international trade theories of Adam Smith and Ricardo that we talked about from chapter six. And um, the intellectual case for this view has been strengthened by the inter um, internationalization explanation of foreign direct investment where the free markets uh, view uh, argues that international production should be distributed among countries according to the theory of competitive advantage and countries should specialize in the production of those goods and services they can produce the most effectively and trade for the rest. You know, so within this, the, the multinational enterprise is an instrument for dispersing of uh, productions of goods and services and more effectively choosing locations around the globe to make global commerce the most effective, uh, pro profitable and cost reduced, um, cost effective uh, for global trade, benefiting the world with um, a huge assortment of low-priced goods and creating more work opportunities and lifting more people out of poverty. Um, now, a lot of some companies, you know, there's there are trouble or there's some discomfort when a company such as Dell, for example, may move its computer manufacturing operations from the United States to Mexico, or when Apple Computers moves its manufacturing from the United States to say China, Taiwan, or uh, Philippines or Vietnam, Vietnam uh, to take advantage of lower labor costs. Um, so for free market view, moves such as this can be seen as increasing the overall efficiency of resources and utilization in the world economy. You know, Japan, uh, China and Mexico, due to the lower labor costs, and Mexico for its advantage from shipping back to the United States, uh, China for its uh, technology, um, 
highly skilled manufacturing and low cost manufacturing wages has been a competitive advantage for assembling PCs and smartphones. By moving the production um, from the United States to China or Mexico, companies like Dell and Apple uh, free up U.S. resources to use the activities which the United States has a competitive advantage, such as design, uh, uh, development of computer software, hardware, uh, manufacturing of high-valued components, uh, such as the microprocessors from Intel and AMD, and also a lot of research and development. And these jobs are significantly higher paid and less tedious, so if it's sort of a win-win if we can export the jobs people really aren't thrilled to have, and that would just be not cost effective to have here, but we can keep more of the high paid, high, more prestigious, more innovative uh, core strength jobs in the United States, then we can create a, you know, a more con stronger economy. And in addition, China and Mexico gain from the technology, skills, and capital that is going to be transferred from Dell and, and Apple uh, through foreign direct investment into their countries. Um, stimulating their own economic growth and stimulating their ability to buy the products as well. So it's a win-win, uh, theoretically a win-win for everybody. Um, so the move to globalization and, and the realignment of cost structures and production is serving to you know, expand the economies and the consumers rapidly around the world and create a stronger overall middle class and reduce poverty, which helps escalate the consumption of goods and services, which makes companies very wealthy, which makes stockholders very wealthy. Um, you know, so this is, this is one of the whole point of doing business uh, by using foreign direct investment. So let's look at pragmatic nationalism. In practice, many countries have developed neither a radical policy or free market policy towards uh, foreign direct investment, but instead a policy that can best be described as pra pragmatic nationalism. And this view is that foreign direct investment has both benefits um, and costs. So foreign direct investment um, can benefit a host country by bringing capital, skills, technology, jobs, um, but those benefits come at a cost. When, when a foreign company, um, rather than the domestic company, produces products, the profits from that investment go back, and many times back to the home host country. So many, many countries are also concerned that this foreign-owned manufacturing plants may uh, import many components from its home country as well, which is a negative um, for the, the local companies that could provide uh, those components. It also helps to widen the trade deficit if they're if they're importing a lot of these components. So countries ad adapting a more pragmatic stance tries to look at the good and bad and maximize the good benefits of the foreign direct investment by finding out ways to minimize the bad aspects in their view. Uh, and sometimes companies can make promises that you know for the next 10 years we'll reinvest all profits we make and even some countries pass laws where any profits you make can't be repatriated has to be stay has to stay within the host country and i think brazil has many of those intact you know japan offers an example of pragmatic nationalism in, in the 80s japan policy was probably one of the most restrictive among countries that, um, with foreign direct investment uh, this was due to japan's um, um, perception that uh, um, direct entry into foreign um, by foreign firms, specifically United States firms, with ample managerial resources into the Japanese market would hamper the development and growth of their own industries and technology so they wouldn't be able to fully form their own competitive industries if too many United States companies set up shop and was competing directly against them in the Japanese market. So they blocked a lot of this foreign direct investment and chose to support um, domestic and develop their domestic companies uh, instead even though foreign direct investment from Japanese companies were very strong and pervasive around the world, especially in the United States, they didn't reciprocate in, in kind, and that was sort of looked at negatively from the U.S. government to the Japanese government, creating a lot of tension. Um, uh, some companies like IBM and Texas Instruments were able to set up wholly owned subsidiaries inside of Japan. Uh, by adopting these negotiating positions where they would come to terms and satisfy the government, the Japanese government, with what benefits they can bring to the country and 
um, to hopefully over outweigh any of the negative. So companies can sure, surely work with foreign governments to um, to get access to foreign direct investment in those countries by alleviating some of their fears. Okay, so let's look at some shifting ideology. Um, in recent years, um, there have been a marketed decline in a number of countries that adhere to radical ideologies one way or another. Uh, although a few com countries have adopted a pure free market policy stance, an increasing number of countries have gravitated towards the free market end of the spectrum and have, libera and, and have viewed that foreign direct investment was good overall, mostly good, and, and worked to encourage a lot of foreign direct investment. And you know, such countries as Ireland greatly you know, made specific aggressive policies to attract, attract foreign direct investment because Ireland said, let's you know, reduce corporate taxes and make promises to companies if they come over that a uh, certain amount of years they don't have to pay tax and let's make our um, foreign direct investment as easy and as beneficial as possible and as a result many com companies came into Ireland and hired a great deal of Irish people as their employees increasing the taxes that the government uh, took in and giving the government more ability to spend on infrastructure and education inside of Ireland so sometimes foreign direct investment can be a really good thing if utilized in the best possible way uh, in foreign countries. But you know there are some countries that are a little hostile or suspicious of foreign direct investment and a lot of that has to do with how closely the cultures are aligned. So the Irish culture and, and the United States culture isn't too far apart and there's a lot of trust and a lot of res mutual respect so it's easy for them to encourage this foreign direct investment. But foreign direct investment between countries such as Vietnam and the United States took a long while to, to develop and to move into a more productive um, stance. So as these ideologies shift, some countries that were formerly hostile to it have seen the benefits in other countries and become more open to it and liberalize their ec economies and, and laws to allow for more foreign direct investment. And of course, the benefits for a host country is you get a transfer of technology will come in. So if uh, GM wants to <coughs> build a manufacturing plant, it's going to start training the local population in how to make cars and how to utilize advanced software and technologies and tools. And it's also going to hire a lot of local people. And when you hire a lot of local people, that keeps them off the street they make less trouble. You don't have to subsidize their unemployment or, or welfare. You um, provide um, the resources for their income for them to pay taxes to the government, helping the government collect more income. So, so employment is a huge win effect for a host country, com a, co a country to take in foreign direct investment. Now, um, the balance of payments account uh, records the country's payments and the receipts from other countries. So if the foreign direct investment is made inside the, company, in the country and they're producing the goods inside the country and exporting them, the balance of payments will be more favorable. Um, so the, the country will have more exports uh, generally due to this you know, uh, foreign direct investment and you know, it's favorable to have a surplus rather than a deficit of exports. You know, uh, and it's one thing that the United States usually has more imports and exports, and it's, it's a hot, a hot button topic because of that. Because that's mostly because we consume 20 to 25 percent of all the world's goods and resources. Of course, we're going to have a, um, a trade deficit. But if you um, if you are a country that's allowing a lot of foreign direct investment and a lot of people are setting in shop like they did in China to manufacture goods and services in China and export them, you're going to have a favorable current account surplus, which means you export more than you input and import. And that's usually good for a country because it can help the country build up uh, currency su uh, supplies, which they can later use to invest in buying U.S. treasuries like Japan and China have done so in the recent past. Um, Effects, effects on competition and economic growth. Um, 
So it increases the level of competition in the market, which is good because it drives down prices and improves uh, the local market so consumers can afford to buy more and have lower prices and controls inflation. Uh, but the decrease, the increase in competition can lead to um, the benefits of increased productivity, um, more process innovation as they're competing against each other, and overall a better economic growth if the competition leads to, um, you know, a fiercer domestic competition will make them stronger in international trade. So if the domestic market is very competitive and they're fighting with each other through innovation and trying to outdo each other with design and cost and price, then their products naturally become much more um, competitive overseas as well. So there are some benefits for that. Now the costs, um, it can have effect on local competition. So foreign direct investment can come in and it can displace uh, an indigenous competitor. And this would be bad because now your country is losing its own domestic manufacturing source uh, and loses some control um, and pride over the domestics. Sort of like the United States losing, uh, not manufacturing televisions or microwaves or uh, microwave ovens or things that they invented and having to import everything. Um, and you know, if they drive all, of, all the competition away, then that leads to uh, a foreign entity controlling a monopolistic um, company inside of your country, which is also not a good thing because monopolistic enterprises tend to abuse customers, provide in inferior products at a higher price. So this could be a potential threat. Um, and just like you could also have um, a balance of payment going in the wrong direction. So capital outflows as a foreign subsidiary uh, repatriate earnings to the parent company in the foreign country uh, and this debit would be a debit in the current account so the, the host country balance of payments associated with the imports the imports of input uh, products by the foreign subsidiary so this would make uh, would basically what I'm saying here is that if a foreign direct investment results in a lot of cash being uh, created in profits of the, of the domestic economy and it's exported to the home country of the foreign direct investment. Now the, the currency level in the domestic country will be much lower. That's why uh, countries such as Brazil and China and India have, have certain restrictions about what money can be taken out of the country. Although because the United States taxes this money on the way back to the United States, there's been little incentive for foreign uh, direct investment profits to come back into the United States because of that taxing situation. And there'll always be talk of a holiday from this tax to try to repatriate as much of this money back to the United States for investment back in this country. It's always a, a political hot button. Okay. And also, if you talk about national pride and autonomy, you know, you don't want to be a country where uh, foreign competitors own all the industries and produce all the products and goods and services and they may hire all your your um, citizens but you have no nationalistic pride or the ability to really control these industries uh, and uh, over over a point the country has no real you know ability to um, invest and foster direct because the direct ownership by citizens in your country will make sure that the profits stay local and that your citizens are getting the maximum benefit uh, so if it's all foreigners making money in your home territory it's sort of draining your company of wealth over time and that's a real negative um, so if the home country benefits um, If the it, it's gonna if you have uh, domestic people companies investing in foreign countries and foreign direct investments, the home country are gonna have, um, of course, um, a stronger balance on their accounts if the money is being repatriated. Um, there could be additional employment generated even if they do a foreign direct investment in a foreign country they may have to hire more employees here to manage and remotely deal with the foreign subsidiary especially if it's expansion rather than a move of production um, and they can learn val valuable skills and know-how and uh, valuable market insights into the culture of the foreign market they're investing in and help you know bring some of those ideas back home and transfer it to the home country uh, one such example that I know of is um, 
7-Eleven created a uh, division in Japan, and later the Japanese 7-Eleven broke off and became its um, own company that I believe later purchased the United States 7-Eleven, which is run out of Texas. Now, 7-Eleven in Japan was thriving. They initiated certain um, operational changes to bring in fresh fruits and vegetables, fresh packed sandwiches, uh, a redesign of how uh, the operational and the product contents of the 7-Eleven stores in Japan were working, and they were very successful. Inside the United States, 7-Eleven was failing and not doing very well at all and, and got into a bad situation. So the know-how and the expertise that was developed in Japan came back to help manage 7-Eleven in the United States uh, at, what, at one point, which was the parent company, and actually saved 7-Eleven and brought them back from the brink to a very strong company. So if 7-Eleven really never made that foreign direct investment initially into Japan, they never would have been able to bring over and bring back the operational efficiencies and um, store layouts and product uh, displays that, that were developed in Japan back to the United States to save the parent company. So there's a good example where valuable skills learned in the foreign market and concepts such as operations and distribution can be brought back to another country and really it strengthen their ability in the domestic market. Um, and of course, um, the balance of payments can be negative or positive depending on what's happening with that foreign direct investment. And the same thing with employment. In the home country, if, the, if it's going to be a situation where a job, people are laid off here, production facilities are closed and moved overseas, that could be a real negative for the host country. And if the um, products are no longer exported, but they are manufactured in the foreign country and sometimes even imported back to the United States, that can hurt the balance of payment account as well. So there is sometimes some, some um, drawbacks to that. Now, international trade theory and foreign direct investment, um, this could involve some of the concerns over offshore production. Um, you know, foreign direct investment may actually stimulate economic growth by freeing up home countries' resources and taking some demands and uh, reducing inflation to concentrate on activities where the home country has a more comparative advantage. So in the United States, if um, a lot of manufacturing takes up uh, electric and natural resources and exporting it to a country where those electric is a lot cheaper, uh, that can be very, very beneficial. And if, if this redesign... Um, focuses on the home country, starts to concentrate on activities that has more of a comparable advantage, research, development, uh, design, marketing, innovation. It could be a better realignment of, of resources. And customers will all also benefit from the lower prices. And I think in this world today, I mean, clothes, due to the, all the textile changes, clothes used to be a very expensive, very expensive proposition in the past. Today, Clothes are extremely inexpensive compared to the salaries we make and the amount of money, you know, um, that it, it takes so little money to buy, um, you know, if you were to buy seven shirts and seven pants, underwear and shirts and shoes, uh, at one point that could be inflation adjusted thousands of dollars. And today we're talking of hundreds of dollars instead. Uh, and the same thing for computers and electronic equipment and many of the things that we enjoy on a day-to-day -day basis, we can, we have the ability to purchase much more, consume much more because of these foreign direct investments, lowering the costs of many of the products that we enjoy on a daily basis. So it, it can be thought of as a win-win from the fact that, you know, uh, we can focus on our strength and our competitive advantage and, and maximize the profits we make on those ends and, and, and have jobs that have high paying salaries. And then these high paying salaries go even further because we're importing and we're bringing in um, goods and services at a lower cost. So now we can have a much higher standard of living through this foreign direct investment. Okay. But, you know, government policy is government policy and it could regulate based on the attitudes of populations and diplomats. They can be um, concerned about uh, encouraging or discouraging foreign direct investment for for different reasons you know um, 
depending on what you know the government policy um, you know you know for example the host country's attitude attitude towards this uh, is is going to be a big factor in whether to locate the production into that foreign country so if the government's not supportive of it countries companies may shy away you know investing in in countries have huge um, you know that have very open permissive policies towards foreign direct investment is clearly preferable to investing in countries that are hostile towards it or restrictive however these issues are not straightforward and it takes time to understand a country sometimes isn't so straightforward and just there 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 are nuances to the policy and what they're really trying to get at so you know you may not really even realize it until you have some experience in the area um, so despite moving forward with free market stance in recent years many countries have a rather pragmatic stance toward foreign direct investment in such cases a firm considering foreign direct investment must you know often negotiate specific terms of the investment in the countries with the country's government you know before making the investment and such negotiations can center on um, the host government trying to attract um, the foreign direct investment um, and incentives the host government are prepared to give a multinational uh, and what the firm will commit in exchange for tax reductions or, or gifted land or uh, uh, minimum wage guarantees. The host government is if a host government is uncertain about the benefits of foreign direct investment, it may choose to restrict access, allowing these companies only to a special economic zone, uh, not free access to the entire country. Uh, but to a large degree, the outcome of any negotiations agreement depends on the relative bargaining power of each party. And each side's bargaining power depends on three factors. The value each side places on what the other has to offer, the number of comparable alternatives to each side, and the time horizon for each party. And from the perspective of a firm negotiating the terms of an investment with a host government, uh, the firm's bargaining power is if the firm's bargaining power is high when the host government places high value on what the firm has to offer the number of comparable alternatives open to the firm is greater and the firm has a long time in which to complete the negotiations and you know the the reverse of this also holds also holds true the firm's bargaining power is low when the host government places low value on what the firm has to offer and and the number of comparable uh, alternatives open to the firm is fewer and the firm has a shorter time you know to negotiate so if it's, it's sort of like if say there's a industry that's known for a lot of pollution and a lot of um, you know using a lot of chemicals or something that's really not good for local populations or drinking water the uh, foreign governments may be hesitant in allowing them to build their manufacturing or chemical plants uh, in those countries and in the past we had a horrible thing happen in India where there was a chemical company that something happened at the plant, gas was released, and it killed a huge amount of domestic population. Uh, I think maybe it was 3M. I'm not exactly sure, so don't quote me on that. So there, there are, and governments learn, like once these abuses happen, that they got to be a little bit more picky about the type of foreign direct investment that comes into the country. Um, okay, so... So uh, many nations, governments have backed insurance programs to cover major types of foreign direct investment risks so the government can actually buy insurance um, and they they will sometimes eliminate the double taxation of foreign income so as not to discourage foreign direct investment uh, and they'll even relax restrictions you know if they're trying to encourage um, outward foreign direct investment you know uh, so double taxation something the United States has many com company countries have said listen if you pay tax in the foreign country when you bring the money home you don't have to pay tax domestically and a lot of like I said earlier a lot of politicians argued for the fact that that's how the United States should be because we want these companies to bring back these profits and reinvest them in the United States something that they're not willing to do if they have to pay income tax on so you know even though um, the United States does encourage outward uh, foreign direct investment. They're not as accommodating as you think they should be. You know, um, if they're restrictive on outgoing foreign direct investment, um, and this includes the United States, they've exercised control over the foreign direct investment from time to time, and they can manipulate the taxes to make it less favorable. They can um, uh, restrict. Uh, uh, 
uh, certain corporations from investing in certain nations for political reasons, such as Cuba. We're not allowed to, at one point, you know, travel is restricted. There's no direct investment allowed. So the governments and policies, they're not a completely free market. They still play with um, restricting for their own political gains of what the host country is trying to, um, you know, you know, where they're trying to bring their policies to. Now, uh, encouraging inward foreign direct investments, governments can offer incentives to foreign firms um, to invest in their home countries. And this is a lot of developing nations uh, want developed countries to bring, you know, in this foreign direct investment to bring money into their country and resources uh, to transfer know-how, hire employees, um, and they, they often try to capture foreign direct investment away from other countries and they'll fight each other uh, negotiations so companies can really benefit as these you know as these companies countries um, really fight and offer a great deal to have them come into the domestic markets if it is solely just for the reason to uh, reduce unemployment would be a big gain you know uh, and of course they can be restrictive a host country can be restrictive and there can be ownership restraints placed on foreign firms in certain sectors not allowing the cause of national security you could see how we wouldn't want um, a foreign direct investor to come in by defense contractor you know say russia buys um, uh, northrop grumman that could be a big issue or china buys lockheed martin they we the government is going to restrict that because of national uh, concerns of them getting defense secrets and defense plans and weapons technology um, and there can also be performance requirements placed on foreign direct investments to maximize the benefits and minimize the cost of foreign direct, direct investments in the host country. So they could say that they have to expand by a certain level or hire, so they could hire so many people or so they could put actually requirements on the foreign direct investment. Okay. Um, international institutions and foreign direct investment. The World Trade Organization uh, has, in the past, there wasn't any um, involvement by multinational institutions, but the World Trade Organization has established a uniset, universal set of rules to promote and establish a um, consistency in foreign direct investment where, you know, to promote more free trade around the world. So there is some international institutions who are now involved in this so this you know this is just another cornerstone of what's setting the stage for a um, um, the explosion of globalization and world trade uh, next chapter we look at regional economic integration uh, and we'll talk about how um, regional uh, geographic economies are coming together to form trade blocks and free trade zones and such like that and that effect on international trade. Okay, I'll see you next time for chapter nine. Uh, take care.